So we're talking tonight about organizing for success, which I'll tell you right now, I think is probably the session that if I were in your shoes, I would be the least excited for, like really how much can you say about organization? Um, but I also think it's the most impactful in terms of setting up the entire structure of your classroom. So I'm hoping that you'll appreciate more and more as we go through this session why it's so important, why it's so critical for a teacher to be highly organized. Um, let me just tell you one thing before we start into the notes. Is Ray Reitzel's name familiar to anyone? Ray Reitzel, he's the editor of the, or I should say former editor of the reading teacher up at, um, that's out of Utah State, and he's a professor up there, and his department produces more research in the field of literacy than any other department at USU. And I was in a training with him once, and he said that he had gotten to the point in his career where he could walk into a teacher's classroom and he could tell before he ever met the teacher, he could tell just by looking at the classroom whether that teacher was highly effective, moderately effective, or not effective. He could tell based on how the room looked. Does that make anybody else kind of cringe? Like, oh no, I left a pile of papers on my desk and there's something on my counter. It made me feel that way a little bit, but the more I have gone into teachers' classrooms, the more I've realized that's true. Um, I'm going to embarrass Audrey for just a minute. Audrey, raise your hand. She's, <laughs> she's not raising her hand. That's Audrey, <laughs> red shirt. Um, so she uh, taught third grade last year, and I, I hadn't met her yet, but I had heard fabulous things about her, so I went to watch her one day, and I hadn't heard her teach yet. The kids were not in the room, but I walked into the room, and I went like this, and I just glanced around at her room and I was like, okay, if Ray Reitzel is correct, based on just the layout of this room, just how tidy and organized it is, she's going to be a highly effective teacher and she absolutely was. Past tense, sorry. You're out of the classroom. Um, so I, I hope you'll appreciate more and more as we go through this tonight how important it is to truly be organized, to have a good structure set up in your classroom. Before we talk about that, let's talk about Rudy Giuliani. Who was the mayor of? New York, New York City. He was in New York. Um, so he was in office from 1994 to 2002, in case you didn't know. And one of his platforms was addressing the homeless population. And the homeless population prior to him taking office was, um, was really problematic, especially in the subways. And so he tackled this problem of the homeless population sleeping in the subways, how? Well, he had been um, a federal prosecutor. He had a lot of experience with the police force, so a lot of people expected that when he said he was going to target the homeless problem in the subways that he would maybe impose fines or maybe he would um, um, institute jail time, or maybe he would begin an incentives program, maybe he would create some more homeless shelters. There was a lot of speculation about how he was going to address the problem of the homeless population in the subways, and he didn't do any of those things. Does anyone know what he actually did? It was structural. This is so cool. So look at that bench, nicely made for sleeping, and this is what he did. He said, let's just change the structure of the benches. We're just going to put little bars between them so they're not comfortable to sleep on. And that was the end of the sleeping problem. Well, it wasn't the end, but it was a huge beginning of the end of the sleeping problem um, in the subway. So we're talking tonight about structure. Will you say it with me? Structure, you got it. Um, here's the main idea. I think this is the first thing to fill in on your notes. <clears throat> Do I need to change the structure of my students, materials, or tasks in order to make success more likely? And we'll go into detail with each of these, but um, that's the main idea tonight. Initially, this was supposed to be our very first session. This was supposed to be orientation because it is so foundational. Do you get it? Picture of a foundation. Do you get it? It's so foundational to a classroom. If you've got a classroom that has um, students' materials and tasks strongly in place, carefully, thoughtfully in place, um, and you have a strong foundation, you can get a lot of other good behaviors for free without having such a strict reward system. You can go ahead, Maddie. We're all listening. 
there you go. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, so I found, I found this picture to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. This lovely home that's obviously been thoughtfully designed and is fairly new is toppling over. Why? Because it has a weak foundation. It has a weak structure. The same thing is true in our classroom. You can have the best reward system in the world. You can be so good at giving corrections. You can use all the engagement strategies known to man. But if, uh, if your structure, if your organizational strategies are not in place to begin with, all of those will topple. So here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'm going to go through three semi-rich examples of each of these pieces, uh, students, materials, tasks, and then I'm going to give you a lot of practice time for you to say how could we improve on students' materials tasks in order to prevent or solve some of these problems that commonly occur in classrooms. Uh, so this first one, and these are all real examples by the way, uh, happened, it's happened a few times actually, but most recently, it was in a third grade teacher's classroom and her students were seated on the rug in vertical format. So this square right here, that's where the teacher was and then her students were seated vertically in front of her. Does that make sense? And so um, what would happen is as she would try to talk to them, they were, they were really far away from her and she couldn't use her proximity to her advantage. And don't you know proximity is like classroom management 101, right? Um, if you count on here, there's the teacher. How far away is the farthest student from her? How many students deep? Six, right? So super easy fix is to move the students and move the teacher, so that's what we did. We put the teacher over here and we had the students turn their bodies from facing this way to facing this way. So now, looking at the teacher, how far away is the farthest student? Only four, right? So we've eliminated two, um, two lanes of change, you might call them, in order to make the teacher's use of proximity more viable. So here's the essential question. When you're talking about students, when we're thinking about how to maybe arrange or move the students for effectiveness, here's the essential question. Would moving students or assigning them places make their success more likely. And I believe there's a place for you to write that down if you'd like to. Would moving students or assigning them places make their success more likely? Let me give you one other quick example while you're writing. We had in this group um, <laughs> a little guy that sat on the back row here um, and he loved to lay flat. Every time they went to the rug, he just sprawled out and he was ready for his afternoon nap. Do you know this kid? Have you seen this kid? <laughs> um, again, we could, we could implement some sort of incentive program, we could do a correction, but the easier thing to do was just to give him an assigned spot in the middle of the group so that he was surrounded on all sides by kids who were not laying down. And then he was kind of forced to sit up just by nature of the beasts around him. So that's example number one. Move the students. We say it. Move, Move the, the students. students. Thank you. Example number two has to do with materials. How can we move materials? Okay, so again, real example. Um, I worked with a teacher last year who kept her whiteboard markers in a container and then she would assign students to go get the whiteboard markers every time it was time for math. So they did whiteboard practice on their boards, which I loved. I'm a huge fan of that. But she would say, okay, whiteboard helpers, would you go get the markers and pass them out? It was one of her class jobs. So the whiteboard kids would go over to the side of the room, they would count out how many they needed for their row, and then they would go through and start passing out. And guess how long the transition took? Too long. It was over three minutes, but it <laughs> even one minute would be too long, right? Um, it was really noisy, and then she had to go like this, and bring them all back together and quiet them down before she could start instruction. Every day it was problematic. In this case, um, problem with materials, that's what the M is for, it's a problem with materials, so we changed how the materials worked. Um, I said, can we just move the markers? Could we give them the markers and just put them in their desks? Would that be okay if they just kept the markers in their desks? You say it's time for whiteboard practice and they just pull it out, and here, <laughs> here was her response but they'll lose it. 
their desks are so messy. They're going to lose their markers. They can't keep their markers in their desks. True, right? That desk is too messy. A kid's never going to find a whiteboard marker in there. You're going to have the same length of downtime, same length of transition if this is the case. So again, looking at materials, we said, OK, well, then let's, let's go a little deeper with this. So here's what we did. Um, we got tubs at Walmart for a dollar each. Do you love Walmart? I have a love-hate relationship with Walmart. I hate that I need it. <laughs> I hate that I love it. So we got tubs at Walmart, and then uh, we put all of the items that they commonly used in this tub. What I want you to notice then is we had the, we had the student's number on the name tag, and then we also put the numbers on the items in the tub so that if it ever fell on the floor, the kids were directed simply to hold it up, not say anything, just hold it up, and then I could come and take it from Chris and say, raise your hand if you are number 15, and hand it to that student. Um, the marker right here is sitting on top of the sock. In actuality, we put it inside the sock so that they also had an <coughs> eraser. They had a place to keep the marker and something to erase with, um, but for sake of showing you what it looked like, I've left it on top. Um, one other idea that I saw a teacher do just this week, I took a picture of it because I thought this was great. She ordered these tubs from Lakeshore Learning. She said they're actually considered paper trays, not student trays, but um, she did the same thing with her kids where they have all their non-book or non-folder, non-paper items in the tub. And then what she did, this is my favorite part, she, this is a little banana bread tin. And she put her crayons in the banana bread tin so that she doesn't have issues with kids trying to find motor, put the crayons where they go. Loved it. Uh, last thing I'll show you from this, the same teacher said, well, the reason I don't use math manipulatives is because it takes too long to pass them out and collect them each day. If that's the reason you don't use math manipulatives, guess what? It's a materials issue. Um, so that's what this is right here. It's what's called the student's math box. Uh, and it's really just a pencil box from Walmart, but we put in it all the things that the students would need for math, and they just kept it in their desk so that they had access to the math manipulatives. In other words, uh, students not doing whiteboard practice or not using math, math manipulatives was not because they didn't have access to materials, we just made it easier to access the materials. So our second main idea is change the materials. Can we say it? Change, change the, the materials. materials, thank you. And then the last one, the last example I'll give you, has to do with changing students' tasks. Um, so here's what was happening in this classroom. As the kids came back from prep every day, the teacher was starting with an academic vocabulary chart. The kids took out their charts and they were supposed to do it with her. Guess how motivated they were to come in and do that? Eh, not at all. But the second task that this teacher did each day was a song that goes with uh, the Reading Street lesson. So we just said, could we start with the song instead? We're still going to do academic vocab. Um, but let's start with the song instead because they love the song. They're excited for the song. So as they started coming into the classroom, um, she would hit play and they would start singing the song. Guess how fast they got to their seats? Super, super fast because they were, they were excited to do this activity. Um, so the essential question when it comes to tasks is not, it's not, can I, <laughs> can I not do what my principal has asked me and not follow the schedule? That's not what this is about. It's about, can I reorder the student's tasks in order to make success more likely? In other words, your math time might be from one to two every day and you don't have any control over that because of when kids have to leave for speech or resource or whatever, that's okay, but can you reorder the tasks within that time period in order to make success more likely? So our third major question is, can we change the tasks? Okay, so, I'm hoping somebody has a fun acronym. I've been thinking about this because my daughter in math uses the please excuse my dear Aunt Sally a lot. She uses that acronym a lot to help her remember the order of operations. And I have not been able to come up with a fun acronym or a fun little 
thing we could say that goes with, see, I can't even remember it. Students, materials, tasks, SMT. So if one of you at the end could think of something brilliant that we're all going to say and remember for the rest of eternity so that we remember first to address students, materials, tasks, I have a candy bar for you. So many things. So many things. That might be the winner. Okay, we're, I li okay, I like both those. Do you have ones shared? It's good. You're getting you're getting voted. What? Save my toots. Save my toots. Good heavens. That's what everybody will remember. Even if we choose something else, that's what they'll remember. So many things. Save. My, I kind of like so many things because there are so many things you can do in this category that will prevent problems from happening, which I hope you'll see as we keep going. Lynn, can we just adopt it? Sure. SMT is going to stand for so many thi things. Excuse me. I've been losing my voice all day. Okay, so here's what we're going to do next. For the following scenarios, if you flip your packet of notes to the next page, um, I'm going to ask you to think about if a restructure of the students' materials or tasks would make success more likely. Here's the deal. None of these problems, these are all real problems that have occurred in actual classrooms in Cache County School District. None of these problems required a rewards program. None of them required a correction. None of them required greater use of engagement or greater use of parent volunteers or a behavioral aid. All of these problems were solved by paying attention to either students, materials, or tasks. So what I'm going to ask you to do for the first, let's see, where does it tell you to pause? After number five? Okay, so I wanna start just looking at the first five problems and I'm only gonna give you five, maybe not even five minutes, four minutes to just go through on your own and think about how could I solve this problem by making a change in either the students, the materials, or the tasks? And then I'm gonna ask you to talk to a partner about what you decide, and then we're going to share out with the group, and I'll tell you what we actually did, okay? So you might wanna leave yourself some space to take additional notes um, for when you work with a partner and when we share out with the group in case you wanna to add to your ideas. Uh, four minutes for numbers one through <coughs> five. That wasn't quite four or five minutes, but I forget you guys are adults and you work so much faster than students. So uh, here's what I'd like you to do. I don't have our board to show partners A and B. So I'm just going to ask you to take turns for who goes first, but with your partner, would you go through just numbers one through five and share your idea? What did you say might be a good structural approach to fixing each of these problems? Um, if you're the letter A, why don't you go first? We'll start that way. Uh, here's how I would like to do this. In true partner share style, you should always share out, right, after you have a partner talk. So I will just draw a couple of sticks. Will you tell us what you and your partner came up with and we'll talk about each one. We'll just go through them one by one. Um, so for the first scenario, we said students fight about where to sit on the rug and in line. Is that students' materials or tasks that need addressed? Will you tell us, well, first of all, just What'd you say? Well, no, I'll draw a stick. You can tell us what you thought, because people might have different answers. Natalie, students, materials, or tasks? What'd you guys say was the problem there? You said students. Okay, problem with students. We'd assign them a spot that's on the rug. Okay, assign them a spot for where they sit on the rug. Yeah, and then in their line order, so that that way it's the same spot each time they're in line or on the rug. Okay, so they have a line order, they're assigned a line order, and they're assigned a spot where they sit on the rug. Anybody have a different idea? That one was, yeah, Natalie. In student teaching, when they lined up in the line, they were called by the quietest group. Okay. And then they just came right to where they were called. Okay. So you, assign, you let the kids line up who are quietest, and they come exactly where they've been called. So quietest gets to be in the front, essentially. Okay, perfect. Um, let me tell you what, what we did with this. Actually, I shouldn't say this teacher. I should say these teachers, because this is really common. Um, but my disclaimer before I say this is that nothing I say up here today is gospel truth. If you have a way that works for you or you hear an idea that you like better, absolutely adopt that. This is not my way or the highway. That's not how this goes, okay? 
This is just a suggestion, and if you like it, if you think it would be helpful for you, feel free to use it. But here's what, here's what I typically do in classrooms where kids fight about uh, where to sit on the rug and in line. First of all, yes, it's a student problem. Students need addressed. Um, so typically, we assign them a line order. Uh, when you line up, the easiest way, I think, to split them visually um, is to do a boy's line and then a girl's line. So when they line up in line or when they are at the rug, they have an assigned spot where they are supposed to sit. Uh, something I just learned recently that I think is really interesting is that MRI scans reveal that our brains do an assessment for how safe our environment is four times every second. Is that incredible to you? Four times every second our brains are assessing and scanning the environment saying, do I need to fight? Do I need to take flight? Do I need to freeze? What do I need to do to stay safe in this situation? So I think assigning spots for students goes beyond just, oh, they're having problems, let's give them an assigned spot. For me, I think it gives students a level of predictability and safety and stability um, that they often appreciate. Sarah? So one of the things I, I've been thinking about with the last comment about um, calling your quietest kids forward is if you've got a rowdy group of boys then all of a sudden they're super far away from you because they're still being rowdy over here and they're the last ones called. That proximity doesn't exist and they're even <coughs> further out of your eyesight if you're walking behind. Okay, that's a great point. That might so, be a problem you might find. let me repeat it for sake of the video too that if you are calling quietest kids to line up first and your rowdiest kids get to line up last, guess where they now are? In the back, farthest away from you. Yeah, great point. Um, with line order, you can often prevent that. You might be saying, oh, wait, though, Sarah, you just put all the boys together. Yeah, but I know this kid can handle standing by this kid. Who can handle standing by this kid? He couldn't have handled standing by that kid. So that's why he's three persons away. Um, raise your hand just, just in here if you generally try to sit in about the same spot from week to week. You're doing it like you're ashamed. You don't have to be proud. Raise your hand if you sit in about the same spot. Oh, there we go, Tara, yes. <laughs> because we like that, don't we? We like the predictability. I went to a conference in Salt Lake a couple weeks ago, and it was only a two-day conference, nine to five, two days. And the very first day, we sat kind of near the front, and the second day I went in, and there was this guy sitting at the table who had not been there the first day, and I immediately was like, what's he doing at our table? <laughs> What, why is he in our spot? And they were not assigned seats. I, like, nobody told me, this is your spot. This is where Cash District will sit. That was just in my mind. I had created that I liked that area, and I wanted the comfort of being in that area. So yes, it helps behaviorally, but I also think it gives kids a level of comfort, predictability, safety to give them assigned spots. Um, this video is, I think, three minutes. Um, I wanted to show it because I had already taught my first graders that they had assigned spots, and I had shown them this in the classroom. We had practiced line order in the classroom, um, but now we're doing it out at recess. And you'll see two examples of me calling them to line up from recess. What I want you to notice is that the first time I have them practice finding line order, it takes them a minute and a half. You don't have to time it. You can just take my word for it. It takes them a minute and a half before everybody is exactly where they're supposed to be. But the second time we do it, guess what? It takes them 10 seconds takes them a fraction of the time because we've practiced it. So this is really just to say, if you're going to do a line order, you're going to have to practice it in the classroom and out of the classroom for kids to be successful. Just like yesterday, we're going to pretend to practice, we're going to pretend to play, and then you're going to practice lining up in your assigned spot, in your new assigned spot. This is called a practice. Kids who do it will get to have the real recess. Ready? Pretend to go play. Oh my goodness, look at all you big second graders. Holy cow, nice to see you. Thanks for the hugs. Okay, for one, Hi, Riley. is the camera Hi, going? Did you ask I'll talk to you in just a minute, okay? Hi, Riley. Oh, sorry, Dave. Okay, 
Okay, you should be thinking about where your spot is. I should have my girls behind Eliza, my boys behind Gabe. Okay, my girls line should go Eliza, Alexa, Addie, Ashlyn, Tessa, Layla, Kaylee, Claire, Miriam, London, Hallie. Oh, turn your line this way. Come over this way. Brooklyn. Perfect. Girls, excellent job. My boys line should go. Let me see. Gabe, Benjamin, Finn, Wyatt, Todd. Excellent. Jacob. Where's Jacob? Jacob, you're up here. You stand right behind Todd. That's your spot, okay? Okay, Todd, Jacob, JD, where's JD? Right there, you always stand behind him. Abe, you stand there. Trevor, Tate, good Tate. Danny, good, Zach, Zach right there. Tyler and Daniel, good job. So Jacob, you watch, you watch for Todd because that's where you'll stand is right behind him. Okay, my class, guess what? Good job coming quickly, but now we need to practice finding our spots quickly and standing quietly. When I blew the whistle last time, guess what? Wyatt was the first one over here who was standing like this in the line. He was in his spot and his mouth looked like this. He was ready. Awesome, Wyatt. I want our whole class to be able to do that. Kids who can follow the directions will get a real recess. So you're going to pretend to play, then you're going to line up in this spot quietly. Pretend to go play. ready quickly and quietly. So I would say yes, even younger kids can handle assigned spots and yes, it will help them to have assigned spots. It will help them come quickly. It will help them behave appropriately to stand next to peers you know they can handle being next to. Um, okay, for number two, uh, let's talk about what you said. After recess, students spend several minutes opening books and finding correct page numbers. So it's time for go math and, and turn to page 42 and you've got 18 kids that cannot find page 42. What do you do? What did you say? Chelsea. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay, well, I thought we're both kindergarten, so we thought maybe to have them open to the correct page before recess, kind of as like their ticket to recess. That oh. way it's done. Um, but my partner had a really good idea of bookmarks. Okay. So. <laughs> <Revolutionary>. Bookmarks. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought of that. I love that. Yes, bookmarks. You could create a material, right? That would be under the category of creating a material. Give them a bookmark, put it in. Now your book is easily open to the right page. Mm -hmm. Or Chelsea's idea, give the kids a ticket to recess to have it open to the right page before they leave. Love it. Uh, anyone else want to share a different idea? Yeah, Megan. Um, for go math, I'm not gonna lie, this isn't my idea. All my kids told me the third grade teachers did it. So if you rip it out every day, then you just open it into their first page. Okay, so you rip out the page every day, they take it home, and then the next page that they're open to is automatically the right one. Mm -hmm. I love that as a parent because then I could see what was taught that day in go math. I would be able to see this is the content that was covered. So yeah, that's another great idea. Easy way to address the material without creating a penalty or reward. So here's what we did in this class where this was a problem. Um, we said it's a problem of materials. We can change the materials. 
and we did what Chelsea suggested. We just said, okay, your ticket to recess is that you have to have your book open to the correct page before we go outside. Would it have to be Go Math? No, it could be Reading Street, it could be Elevate, like pick the content, it doesn't matter. But the idea is that you have to have it ready to go before you exit the classroom. And guess how fast they were finding page numbers then? I found it, I found it, I'm the first one, can I go? And as soon as it was open to the correct page, you could go get in your line order to walk out the door. So again, take it if it's helpful to you. If not, that's okay. Let's go to number three. Students constantly raise their hands during instruction and work time to ask to sharpen their pencils. I've decided pencils are the bane of teachers' existence. Do you agree? <laughs> How could something so little be so hard? Um, they constantly raise their hands to ask to sharpen their pencils. What do you do? Mimi, you're like, don't call on me, don't call on me. Tori? Where's Tori? There you are. Um, you can either have them have pencils sharp from the beginning of the day on the desk already, or have a place in the classroom where they're sharp, so they just go grab one and they go sit. Okay, so two ideas. Either they sharpen, they have an, a number of sharpened pencils at their desk, so they can just trade for a sharp pencil, or sharpen pencils somewhere in the classroom, and they could go trade somewhere in the classroom for a sharp pencil. Anyone have a different idea? Tara? Um, in our classroom, they each had their own pencil couch with their number on it. And I gave them seven sharpened pencils at the beginning of the year and their pink curl eraser. Okay. And their morning job is to sharpen any pencils in there that they need. And then if throughout the day a lead breaks or goes dull, then they just swap it out right there at their desk. And then the next day they can sharpen whatever pencils need to be sharpened in the morning. But that has to be done in the morning. It has to be done in the morning. And Love it. And then the pencil fairy can visit every once in a while if they have great pencils that are sharp and ready to go, then they get a little eraser or something like that. Something, some recognition for taking care of their pencils. Okay. But you essentially say all your sharp pencils are in one place and you trade when you need it, but only sharpen in the morning. Okay, I'll, we probably have time for one more. Lynn? I uh, give them a dollar for turning in assignments. <laughs> Not a real dollar, I'm a teacher. <laughs> assignments on time for getting their plan and stuff. If they need to sharpen a pencil, they give me a dollar. Oh, okay. So you just say, yeah, you can sharpen your pencil, but you're going to have to pay me for it. So that they're less likely to want to do that. Okay. Um, in classrooms I've visited, in my opinion, this is a problem with materials. This can be fixed by addressing materials. Um, in one teacher's classroom, this is what we did. We just created a bin of sharp pencils and she sharpened them after school every day. Not that you would have to, but that's what she did. She sharpened them after school every day. And when teachers had a dull pencil, she told them it was as if the pencil had died and they would lay it flat in the bin and trade for a sharp one. And then she really, this was fantastic, I loved this. She practiced with the kids when she implemented this system and she said, okay, I wanna see. She took somebody's pencil and broke it on purpose, snapped the tip, said, okay, we're gonna watch. See how fast Natalie goes and trades her pencil. Oh my goodness, she's walking. She didn't even look at which one she wanted. She just picked one and she's back at her seat. Holy cow, that was amazing. So she included a little bit of model and practice before she set the kids loose and it worked so much better. Okay, number four, students come into the room every morning and don't complete their morning jobs, meaning the teacher must individually remind students what to do. <coughs> Did you choose your lunch yet? Oh, you've got to choose your lunch. You better go sharpen your pencils. You haven't sharpened your pencils. Uh-oh, you didn't turn in your homework. Where's your homework? Like it was this to every single kid. How do we fix it, Mateo? We don't do homework. What? We don't do play morning jobs. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no morning jobs. <laughs> Everything is easy. <laughs> uh, but um, when they arrive, they have to take their chairs down. Um, that tends to be noisy. Sure. Okay. But um, I think they're used to it at this point. I'm sure they understand different piles for different tables. Okay, so in your classroom it's a routine. They know that's what they're supposed to do. Okay. Draw one more. Uh, she's not here tonight. Celeste. Where are you? There you are. Um, okay. jobs and then um, a list of one to three things that they need to complete and then that way they don't come up and bother me and what do I do what do I do so it's all on the board 
So it's just posted. There's a visual prompt. Yeah. Okay. Um, for this teacher that I, she was a third grade teacher, again, said it's a problem of materials, so we created signs. And I did not create these cute Hobby Lobby signs. That was not what we did. What we really did was just printed them on computer paper, drew a little picture as a prompt, and put them in sleeve protectors. But then we had a parent who said, can I make these cute for you? And we were like, um, yeah. So their jobs were turn in your homework, answer question of the day, worksheet on your desk, trade your pencils, choose your lunch, and fill up your water bottle. Those were the things they had to do. Does that just make you want to go, oh? I think that's so stinking cute. Tara? In that order, or did it matter? Um, no, it was in this order. Yeah. OK, last one for this section. The hot problem in math confuses kids each day and causes problems, causes movement, talking to each other and to the teacher as they seek help. <laughs> My daughter was reading this last night. She was looking through this packet, and she goes, the hot problem? What's that? And I was like, you don't have to do the hot problem in math. And she goes, oh, the hot problem. <laughs> she goes, yeah, we did last year, but I never understood it. So that's why it doesn't really mean anything to me. And I was like, OK. I hear that over and over, though. That's so common with so many kids. The hot problem, oh, no. So what do you do? My sticks have just started over in case you're like, hey, I already had a turn. What did you say, Becky? You do it as a class together before you start your independent work. Oh, so you shift the order of the task. Do it together as a class before you start the independent work. And in fact, that's what we did. If the hot problem's number four, we're going to start with that first. We'll do it together as a class, or maybe I'll let you try it on your own for a minute before we do it together as a class. We'll talk about it in partners, and then you can go through. Perfect. OK, so the next section has to do with recess. The next, I think, five are about recess. So if you're an art person, um, I give you permission to think about how might this apply in your setting, OK? Maybe not recess, but transitions or materials, things like that that might apply instead. Um, let's do the same thing. Could I give you three minutes to try it on your own, and then we'll talk to a partner? OK, three minutes for numbers six through nine. Um, thank you for signaling to me when you were done so that I knew when to move on. Let's uh, look at number six, which said, Students spend several minutes using the bathroom after recess, and several are really late transitioning back into the classroom. What did you and your partner say you could do structurally to address this? Elise? Yes? Um, we just said take them before recess, or take them, make sure they go during recess. And she teaches sixth grade, and they give tardy tickets. I don't know what you do with those tickets. <laughs> so they pay you if they need to go, but otherwise you take them before recess. Yeah. Um, Probably that's the easiest fix in this case, is just to say that um, you're in your line order, we're walking to the bathroom. Even if you don't need to use the bathroom, everybody is just going to stand here for at least one minute so that you don't have problems of kids saying, no, I don't need to go, and then after recess, what do they say? I have to go to the bathroom. Um, or when they get to their art class. <laughs> oh, yeah. Your art teachers will love you if you'll take them before, right? So. Uh, with teachers I've worked with, to me, this is a task order problem. You reshuffle the order of the task and say, before recess, we use the bathroom. Tara? What do you do about the kids that are so anxious to go recess, they don't want to take time to go use the bathroom, or they go in the bathroom and act like they use the bathroom, and they come right back out, because, you know what I mean, because they are in the room? So the thing I found that works the best for that with kids who say they don't have to go to the bathroom is if, if they're still required to stand there for the amount for a minute, a lot of times they will take that time to go in because it's better than just being bored. Probably in 90% of cases that works. If I have a kid with a chronic bathroom problem who after recess is telling me I have to go to the bathroom, guess what my answer is? Nope. Your job is to go before recess. You may not leave the classroom right now to go to recess. And then if I see that they're kind of like doing the dance, then I would wait until other kids were engaged in something else and walk over and say, you may go to the bathroom, but you better run you are coming back right away. Do you understand? And we're having like a really serious, anxious talk about like this is a one-time thing. Um, I've never found that not to work. But in public, in front of the class, when they say, can I go to the bathroom? Guess what you want your answer to be? 
no, because you don't want kids to think that they don't really have to meet that expectation. But you would then let them go in just a minute if you could see it was a problem. Chris? I have a student that I thought for a while that she had, you know, like a bladder infection or something because she was going to the bathroom all the time. I'd ask her to go, and she'd go to the recess, she'd go to the lunch recess, and she'd come in and she'd still have to go. So I contacted the parent, and so now she has a signal that she just does sign language, and I just go like that, and she slips out and comes in, and some of the kids don't even know that she's gone. But it sounds like that was an individualized case, right? She shows oh, yeah. the signal for bathroom, and yes. she has special permission to yeah. leave in that case. Yeah, and absolutely an individual adaptation may be necessary. Thank you. Okay, next one, students don't line up quickly from recess because they can't hear the bell teacher uses as a signal. I don't know where teachers are getting these, but I see so many teachers who have these little, like, elf bells. They, that's what they remind me of. <laughs> and they go outside and it goes, ling, 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 ling. And then when the kids line up, or finally lined up 11 minutes later, they say, you guys didn't come right away. Why weren't you coming right away? You know when you hear that little, ding, ling, 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 you need to come right away. <laughs> This is a problem of what? Students' materials or tasks? Materials. Materials. Okay, this is so obvious. I'm just going to go. Use a loud whistle. I've, even the giant cowbells are not as effective as these lifeguard whistles you can buy on Amazon. They're only $7. Blarix is a fantastic brand. I, I was reading some reviews on these last night, and there were people that had docked it down because it's too loud. I love this whistle, except it kind of hurts my ears. Yeah. <laughs> They're really loud. Or you can go up to Utah State. Theirs are $10, but Utah State sells them at the student center um, for the kids who are, for the kids, for the teachers who are taking PE classes, and they are fantastic. Don't use a little elf bell and expect that the kids are going to come. Rachel? I use the lifeguard whistle as well at my school, and it stands out because no other teacher has one like that. Yay. So the kids Oh, that's our teacher. <laughs> Did you guys see in the video when I blew the whistle and the little girl like went, <laughs> she <laughs> cowered in fear. I saw that later and I was like, oh, I feel kind of bad about that. Paige? This is one that's actually a problem for me. I have a whistle like that. I learned how to blow it in my PE class. But Isn't that funny we have to say that? I learned how to blow my whistle. <laughs> we do, though. We have to learn. But I'm at Cedar Ridge and there's like an awkward building out by the blacktop and so I like blow it once on the blacktop and even out on the field and my kids Right. Some do a little tune and stuff, but they still don't come, so I don't, I don't know what the solution is. So I'll tell you two things in answer to this. My thesis research project was on how to get kids to line up quickly from recess and get quickly into the classroom. We tested 22 teachers to see whose whistle was loud enough to be heard across the entire playground. Out of all 22 teachers, guess how many met the requirements? One. Only one teacher was actually loud enough to be heard around the entire perimeter of the playground. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is no matter how loud you think you are, you probably need to be louder. And you may want to have somebody um, send a tester out, you know, like during, can you guys hear my whistle? Ask your colleagues, can you hear my whistle when I blow it? Um, so that's the first thing I would say is be louder than you think you need to be. The second thing is maybe you need to do some restricted access. Maybe you shouldn't let the kids have free reign of the entire playground if they really can't hear you to line up when it's time to come in. So you say, we're not going to play in this area, we're not going to play in this area, so that I can make sure you hear my signal when it's time to come in. And then if they start to suddenly hear it, guess what you can do? You can release access. Yeah. Um, I have a colleague who uses a duck call, and that's really um, it's duck easy call. to hear in the duck call. And then once the kids are mostly in line, you do a count, we do a countdown. So 10, 9, 8, and then, so there's two. So, so you, you get the duck call, and you get the countdown from 10. Okay, so. so a duck call by the teacher, countdown by the peer, so that there's two prompts, two auditory prompts. Perfect. Um, let's move on so we don't spend all our time on getting kids in from recess. Art people, sorry. I know this doesn't apply. Um, let's go to number eight. Students congest at the exterior school doors when they're coming in from recess because they all want to hold the door together. <coughs> I want to st hold it. No, I want to. It's my turn. You've got eight kids trying to hold the door. Cassie, um, what did you say? Door, 
I love it. So you assign the students, right? This is a problem that could be solved by students, um, assigning them to hold the door and not allowing anybody who wants to to go. Let me show you this picture. Um, this line I showed you where these kids have this line order. What I did in my classroom, and again, you don't have to do it this way, but something that worked for me was to always have the second kid in line to be assigned as the door holder. They were always the door holder no matter where we were going. The kids in front then are the line leaders, but because that's not really fair that they get to be the line leaders forever and always, what I did was a rotating line. So these two kids in front are in front today on Tuesday, but tomorrow they're going to move to the back and now my door holders are my new line leaders. And then they move to the back and the next kids are the line leaders. So the second, whoever is the second person in line is always the door holder. First person is always the line leader. It doesn't work as well with class jobs saying like you have this job for a week or you have this job for a month, but it gives more kids more opportunities, which I liked. So there's a tip and trick if you want it. Annie? What do you do if door holding is not a privilege? In sixth grade, getting in the room first is the privilege not holding the door for everybody and being dead last. Are you answering this? Okay, so the question is, what if holding the door is not the privilege? They're not excited to hold the door. So for my kids, the door holders get to be the second ones in line as well for lunch. Door holders get to be the second ones in line as well for lunch. Mm -hmm. so okay. We have our line leader still, but door holders are always going to be the second ones through through lunch. Okay. And they always want to get their lunch first, so. So you tie it to another privilege. So they go from holding the door in the back of the line, like letting everyone go through, and then come back up at the front. We don't. Lunch. We don't have to have someone hold the door open for lunch. Oh. So that wouldn't. Yeah, that's not so that's happen. part of the problem. Um, I think if it were me in that situation where it's, and these kids, like, I should say this too, just because you hold the door doesn't mean you lose your spot. You can still run back up to be the second person in line. I think I would just say, guess what? It's not a choice. If you're the second in line, you're my door holder. Thanks okay. so much. Love ya. I would just keep it kind of, it's non-negotiable, but keep it kind of simple. Um, I have to tell you, <laughs> because I told my kids, you can always run back up to your spot, but you have those kids that are like really rigid rule followers. I had this funniest little Keegan in my class one year. And after he held the door, and he was really short too, he was like this big, which even for first grade is short. So after he would hold the door for the kids and they would all go through, he knew he could run back up to his spot, but he also knew he was supposed to walk in the school, so he would always go like this. <laughs> and I swear, I, <laughs> I did door holder that way more for me than him because it was just so hilarious to watch. It was so cute. Um, Number nine, students are congested at the drinking fountains after recess and the transition back into the classroom takes way longer than it should. Let's draw one stick. What'd you say, Jill? Jill. Oh, we've got two Jills now. You, because I looked at you first. Okay, so you split the lines. Here's the classroom line, here's the hallway line, and you just split them so you don't have as much congestion. Love it. Um, for sake of time, I'm just gonna go to the next one. Again, a problem with materials. I often recommend just doing water bottles. So this is, this is not my classroom, it's a different teacher's classroom, but she just has name tags on the kids' water bottles, and of course they have assigned spots in the hall where they're supposed to put their materials. Um, and then here's what I would do if I were to go back to teaching. I, I didn't figure this out until my 10th year. Do you know what I used to do at the beginning of every month? I would go to Walmart or Lee's or Macy's, whoever was having the sale, and I would buy a container of water bottles and I would carry it out to the car and I would carry it into the classroom and it was so heavy and it was so cumbersome. And it got to be really effortful just doing it once a month. I didn't realize until my 10th year, why aren't I using a parent for this? How many parents do you have that say, if there's ever anything you need, I'm happy to help. What I would do if I could go back, because I would call Amanda McBride, because she's like parent volunteer of the year. You know who I'm talking about, Paige. And I would say, sweet Amanda, would you just manage this for me? Would you just be in charge of water bottles? I don't care if you bring them in every month. I don't care if you delegate other parents, but would you just take that off my plate? And guess what she would say? Oh my gosh, yes, I'd be happy to. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for letting me be involved. 
Um, and then, in case you're wondering, but when do they fill up the water bottles? That was one of their morning jobs. They had to fill up their water bottle before school. If they didn't fill up their water bottle before school, I would still let them get a drink at the drinking fountain. We're not into cruel and unusual punishment, right? But it was one of their jobs, um, and most kids were really successful doing that, especially if every so often I would say, I better just go put a little tic-tac next to each filled water bottle, because I see so many kids that are filling water bottles. Thank you so much. Every day, students' unfinished assignments are shoved in their desks, and kids can't find anything the next day when it's time to complete their work. Okay, you can see the video, so that's a spoiler. Anyone want to raise their hand and say what they do? Yeah. I have colored um, folders for them, and so certain folders have unfinished work and then a different color. They all have the same color, so I'll say, get out your green folder and put your unfinished work in your green folder. Oh. That's the only thing that goes in that folder. Color-coordinated folders. Wow, I was never that advanced. I love that. Andrew, was it your I hand? Same thing, folders? Okay, this is only a 50 second video and I took it with my phone so the sound's probably horrible, but um, here's an example of kids putting unfinished work in a folder. Okay guys, so you might notice that the top of our paper uh, has a place for your name. Go ahead and put your name on it if you haven't done that yet. And then you might notice that the back of our paper is not done yet. That's because we're going to finish it tomorrow. Tessa read my mind. She's already taking out her blue folder. Would you quietly put yours in your blue folder as well? Yep, Zach, just like that. Perfect, dude. Alexa, already done. Thank you. Claire, already done. Perfect. Guys, super job getting that put away quickly and quietly. And it looks like we are ready for recess. So here's what's going to happen. This was just a tip that um, beyond unfinished work, you should at least consider where other papers will go as well. So a special forms basket can be useful to have for kids to turn in field trip forms or um, permission slips of any sort a separate place for homework worksheets or reading folders, um, a place for library books, a place to put work when it's actually finished, mailboxes. If you don't give kids a place to put their papers, guess what? They will put them all over your classroom and it will be the bane of your existence. Papers and pencils. I've seen it ruin more teachers' classrooms than anything else. I hate to be so cliche, but a place for everything and everything in its place, yes. Um, okay, were we, did we do this one yet? Is that why you're looking at me with blank stares? Like, what are you doing? Okay. How about this? Why don't we finish the section um, two or three minutes independently and then we'll talk to partners about it? Thank you. Thanks for working with your partner so willingly. Um, Teacher asks students do math timings and calendar each day before starting the new increment for math, at which point students struggle to focus and pay attention. Um, what did you say could be done to address that problem? Mimi. Uh, just change the way it's working. You know, do your math at the beginning, the new increment, whatever, and then, or just figure out, there's way too much this chance right there. We were just talking about, like, I don't know. So split up the tasks or reorder the tasks so that it's not so mentally taxing for the kids. I'll tell you why, I, why this one is really important. Um, last year I had a principal who called me and she said, hey, we have three little guys in a classroom that we're thinking of requesting behavior aids for. Would you come and just sit in on the lesson and just see what you think before we make this request and, and use these resources? Because three behavior aids, wow, that's pretty intensive, right? Um, so I went in and sat for math because that was the most problematic part of the day and the teacher started with the math timing and then they did calendar and then they did homework correction, still at their seats, they were now 30 minutes in and then she started the new increment. And guess what the kids were doing by that time? 
like pulling their hair out. These three little boys that were specifically under consideration were flopping on the floor. They were crawling under desks. They were shoving papers off other kids' desks because they were bored. They were mentally taxed. It was too much at that point. So what we did in this case is exactly what Mimi suggested. We said this is a problem with task order. Um, and we moved some things around. So every day she started not with fact practice and not with calendar and not with homework correction because those things are not mentally taxing. They, are not, they don't require a lot of mental concentration and ability. We, st we started instead. When the kids come in and they're fresh, you start the new increment right away. We're gonna, we're gonna start that new content when they are the freshest and most able to focus and pay attention. And then after the new increment, then we took a break and went to the rug to do calendar. And then we came back to our seats and your ticket to recess was to do your math fact paper, which then they were really motivated to do. They wanted to do it quickly because they were ready to go to recess. And we put homework correction earlier in the day. We just shoved it somewhere else. So does she still do math at the same time? Yeah, but we reordered the tasks. And by doing that, not every story ends this way, but by doing that, it was enough in this case for these little boys not to require behavioral services just by reordering the tasks. Teacher spends two to three minutes waiting for everyone to put names on their papers before starting instruction. Oh, this drives me crazy. Crazy. Can I say it eight times? Crazy. OK, it's time to start our new increment. They don't call it that. It's time to start math. Go ahead and put your name at the top of your paper. Oh, I can see Rachel has her name at the top. Celeste has her name. Katie has her name. Thank you. I'm still waiting. I still see eight kids that need their name at the top of their paper. Waiting, waiting. Oh, Lynn got his name. He's so fast. Good, Lynn, waiting, waiting. Even in upper grades, even fifth, sixth grade classrooms, I see this. I'm still waiting for everybody to get their name on top of their paper. What do you do? I'll give you a clue. It's not rewards or corrections. Any idea? Madeline? Um, I was going to say either just practice with the kids or even if they have numbers, assign numbers, they could just write their Just numbers. write your number at the top? Okay, yeah. so sometimes a number might work. One more idea, Natalie? Uh, let's go with this, Natalie. I just count down from 10 and I expect them to be done when I get to zero. Okay, so a countdown. 10 seconds to get your name on your paper. 10, 9, Eight. Here's what I'm going to suggest. I see a couple more hands, but for sake of time, I'm going to show you this is a task order problem, I think. In my mind, this is a task order problem. My suggestion is just start instruction. Kids come in, they're fresh, they're ready to listen, they're ready to start. Just start. Just go. And they can put their name at the top of their paper at the end. When it's time to put it away, I don't know if you noticed, but in that video I said, okay, you might notice we finished the front. We still need to do the back tomorrow, but if your front is all the way done, would you check if your name is at the top? And as soon as, those are important words, as soon as your name is at the top, you can put it in your folder. Because then they're speeding to write their name at the top so that they can put it away or so that they can put it in their mailbox. Marnie. It's a huge problem in art, so I'll do that. Partway through, it, like I'll remind them to put it on, and then later. But I'll make them all raise their hands. To make okay, sure so a that signal. Every person has done it because mm -hmm. if, if you, we have like 500 and something students, so if they don't put their names on it, then they're toast. Yeah. They have to put their name. But consider you could do it at the end of the task. Just start instruction quickly when they're fresh and they're with you. You don't have to bring them back together, and they could put their name at the top at the end. Uh, Teacher's dot camera is located on the side or in the back of the classroom, so he constantly has to move to write on the assignment. What's the problem? Students' materials, tasks? Materials. materials, Andrew. So what if your principal and the way your room is, they say you have to have your dot camera? So I see this in almost every school. Almost every classroom I have visited has, has it set up this way where Technologically speaking, it works best to have the dot camera off to the side or in the back, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? And in almost every case, I see problems because teachers are over here, turned this, the class is here facing that way, and the teacher is here writing and then has to turn, or even worse, is in the back and has to keep traveling to the front and cannot use proximity as their best friend. So I'm going to give you two suggestions. Either number one, 
you get the cords necessary to move that dock camera. In my classroom, that's what I had to do. I just, this is where the dock was. I ran cords and I had a table here. This, if this was my table, my dock camera was here so that I was looking at those kiddos while I was writing and while I was instructing. Or <coughs> if that's not feasible to get cords and, and move the camera, um, I would at least project the image on the screen and write directly on the screen and not on the page itself so that you are in front of those kids. Because the minute you move to the side, you're going to have behavioral problems. Do you know that? The minute you're in the back, guess what you have? Behavioral problems, and it's not their fault. That's a problem of materials. Okay, last one. Kids constantly write or fiddle with their pencils during instruction when they are supposed to be listening. I'm telling you, pencils, they're gonna kill us. Uh, let me just show you a materials problem. I found this. Uh, on reallygoodstuff.com. It's a pencil holder, so it's adhesive. You stick it right on the desk, and then you can tell kids, time to park your pencils. Uh, anytime you, you need them listening, you need them in power position, they're not supposed to be fiddling or moving, you can say, park your pencils, and the pencils fit so nicely in that little slot. Um, and you can get 12 for only $5, which is a really good deal. I think. Um, you do have to replace them from year to year. They're not, they're not durable enough to last you for five years, but I didn't mind doing that because the payoff was so huge for kids to have a place to park their pencil so that they weren't tempted to continue playing with it. Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do. Um, in one minute, or I should say for one minute, before you start your takeaway log, I want you to discuss with a partner what idea has been valuable to you? What insight have you had? What learning has occurred for you? Or what aha have you had where um, this is what you're going to take away? And would you talk to your partner about that before you start your takeaway log? Letter A's, will you go first? Um, two really good questions. I swear the children eat the erasers, but if I put out any type of eraser, they go so fast, what should I do? This is just what I did, okay? I would give them a new eraser at the beginning of the year. It was shiny and new and it was lovely and it had their number written on the side so we knew whose it was. Um, but then I also had these old gross erasers from the year before and if you lost your eraser or if you ate your eraser, you could still have an eraser. I still want you to have access to the tools you need but you could come and trade for one of these old gross ones. And there wasn't a problem with stealing because of course the erasers are numbered. Uh, last question, what, what are the special leave vouchers in our folders for? Uh, Man, not Mandy, Diane. I looked at Mandy behind you. These are for you to be able to go observe. I was going to talk about these next week, but I'll just tell you quickly. These are for you to go observe another teacher if you'd like to. Um, the district will pay for your substitute. So this is for a half day, this is for a half day what you would talk to your secretaries at your schools about this because they know what to do with these. But you would turn this in with your um, absence form. Question? Okay, that's why I was gonna talk about it next week because I'm gonna give you a list of teachers I would recommend. Like Mike Torrey is gonna be on the list, right? So I will give you that list of teachers I'd recommend. Okay, will you put takeaway logs on the back table for me? Yeah, go ahead. Have a great night. Goodbye.